Stacy Brown Summers, and I am casting from the beautiful and rainy Pacific Northwest. And I thank you for uh, watching, whether you're on live today or you're watching this later. Uh, I appreciate you spending your time with us. Um, today we want to talk to you, um, or with you, about translation quality, um, which is a big passion of mine. Um, but before we get started, just a couple housekeeping things. One, um, if you're on the live chat right now and you have any questions or comments or want to participate, feel free or feel free to go to the live chat on the side and type away. Um, we'll try to respond we'll, at the end. We'll have a little um, Q&A time. If you're not watching this live but still uh, have some thoughts as we go along, feel free to put them in the comments and we'll be glad to address those later. Um, in addition, uh, for those of you that stay till the very end of the webinar, I have a very special offer for you. So um, I hope that you hang with us the whole time. Um, we're going to be respectful of your time today, um, but I definitely, um, yeah, want to send you a little gift for staying with us. Um, so now let's get into our topic, um, which is about tracking data for translation quality which is kind of an interesting topic if you know me at all because I'm really not a numbers girl. Um, always, you know, veered away from math classes or any numbers related things in my life. Um, definitely identify more as a right brain type of person. But as you know, with the right brain and the left brain, um, they're, they're very different parts of our... Uh, of our minds and the right brain being the more creative emotional part and the left brain is your data driven part and i think it's important to know this when you're um, working in the quality field at all or just concerned about quality at all um, because there is an emotional component about um, you know that perception that there might be a quality issue and so it's easy to get upset or, um, you know, fired up or any or something like that. Whereas, um, you know, looking at that data um, can help alleviate the stress that might come up if you for a perceived um, quality issue and can drive you to solutions. So I have found, even though it's not my natural tendency to live in the data side of my brain, um, that being able to track and collect data is a the most powerful tool that I have um, in order to uh, delight my clients and provide the best service I can. I'll give you a, an example of what I mean. A few years ago, I was managing a quality team and we had a client who sat me down one day and said, you know, I have a lot of concerns about the data I'm getting from your team. It seems like they're making a lot of mistakes. They're not following all the instructions. There's a big issue here. And of course, you know, it was like a dagger in my heart because this is my passion. Quality is like my thing. And so um, I had to definitely, um, you know, after I, you know, experienced that right brain upset emotional part of, the, of this feedback, um, at, and I processed that, um, I definitely felt like I got to dig into this and find out what her concerns are because I definitely um, want to make sure that the quality that they're getting, um, which in this case was about quality, <laughs> was uh, reliable information. So, um, so we went about to change a little bit our structure and we started measuring quality about the process, about how we track and manage quality. And it was really interesting because we found that as we um, collected data on accuracy, for example, um, we were able to report that to this client. We, we reported out that we had actually, you know, a 98, 99% accuracy. So what she had perceived as a lot of quality issues we're really more in that 2% and maybe they had a big impact. You know, we didn't want to, um, you know, not I, uh, address her issues or concerns, but statements like, oh, you, I can't trust anything out of your team. Um, you know, having that data to present to her definitely um, helped alleviate that concern um, because she could see actually most of the time the data I get from you guys is right and valuable. And when they 
and then we also introduced a, a process um, for how we um, track issues when they do come up so that we can learn from them and that they don't come up again. And so really pulling that feedback out of my right brain and, and processing it with my left brain, uh, <laughs> using as that data, um, really turned around the relationship with this client and it she actually was very um, supportive in helping us achieve our goals uh, for quality and accuracy going forward. So that's, that's an example of what I'm talking about, how powerful data can be because it does affect, one, the perception, and um, two, it helps you um, get to the, the root of the issue. Um, now, specifically about uh, translation quality. Again, I've been in the translation field um, now about 15 years, and quality is, Again, as, as technology improves, translation is more and more available to everyone. You know, there's tools like Google Translate or Bing Translate um, that make language accessibility um, really um, available to anyone. Um, but what isn't always available is translation quality. And so that's what we need to address um, with a system um, to make sure that you know that the quality you're getting is effective. And so why is it so important with translation? Well, one, um, especially if you're translating where you don't speak the target language. So like, for example, you might have a website, an e-commerce site that you want uh, to uh, promote. You're getting a lot of usage in China and you want to promote it. And um, so you decide to translate it into Chinese. And uh, you know, but understand that you're kind of, you'd make that decision and maybe you even move forward and have it translated, but without any sort of quality measures, you just kind of have to depend on, you know, the stories that you get from your clients uh, on if they're, if they're happy with the translation. And, you know, as evidence from my experience with my client, sometimes that story isn't always the best picture especially if you're only getting it from one or two important clients that you work with, um, primarily because it's language itself is um, a right brain function, right? It's um, subjective. It's prone to preferential issues. Um, <clears throat> and so quality needs some definition around it. Like what is good translation and what is not good translation? Um, and so by coming up with some measurements and some ways to track that, you can actually get that definition and it's going to help your um, end result or your end goal. Um, how important is it to have good quality translations? Well, I would say very, very important, especially if you do intend to do business with um, people who are not um, or maybe either limited or not English speakers. Um, we kind of take for granted that English is, you know, one of the most common languages in the world, but at the same time, you can't count on your English website to get the results um, in China um, that a Chinese website would get. And so the reality is um, there's actually a stat out there where 75% of users are more likely to click and convert, um, you know, when it's, uh, when they're reviewing your information in their native language. Um, and again, when I say their native language, I don't mean a Google translated version of their native language. Um, Google translates great for giving you the gist. Um, but when it comes to a business interaction, um, you know, and your marketing strategy, you want to give more than the gist of what you do. And so being able to provide that is going to be really important. And another, um, thing to consider when you're looking at translation is the effects of poor translation. Um, having a poorly translated website can have some humorous results. And somebody from our team was um, in China recently and took a bunch of pictures of funny translations. This one was one of her favorites. Um, I don't know if that this is the worst example of translation because I feel like I'm getting the message of what they want to say, <laughs> especially with the graphic there, but it's still funny and, you know, in most cases, you don't want your website to be a laughing matter for your end users and your potential clients, right? So 
hopefully I've made the case for why translation quality is really important. And um, let's just jump into um, you know, some practical ways that we can um, track and find that quality. Um, <clears throat> so before we get into what, um, what to track, I want to talk briefly about where to find the data um, that you need. Um, and it can be in a lot of different places depending on your process. Um, there's uh, project tracking tools that'll give you a lot of uh, powerful information if you use those. Uh, we use an in-house one called Linguist Link. Um, you can check it out on our website. It's available to everybody. But that gives us a ton of data that is really super useful about how long it takes our linguists to accomplish something, how responsive they are, how, you know, for making our deadlines, things like that. And it helps us really collaborate and um, collect that information. Um, another tool, if you're not using a computer aided translation tool, which you may or may not know a lot about the what we call cat tools. Um, I actually have a training on that. I'll put it in the notes if you want to get more information on using cat tools. And there's a lot of them out there. There's Trados. We use one called WordBee. It's an online tool. Um, and WordBee has some powerful, powerful quality tracking um, metrics and things that they can give us. So that's a big reason why we like to use WordBee. Um, and then thirdly, um, we use a uh, quality tracking system and in my case um, hold on I gotta clean my desktop before I show it to you um, we put one together in um, oh, here let me show you my whole screen so my head's not in the way we put one together in SharePoint and SharePoint comes with your office 365 um, subscription and I just put together a quick form here so our editors as they're tracking quality um, they can come here and complete a form if they if they find the issues and notice here they're gonna uh, they can select different categories of the types of issues that they track this is gonna come in handy later because and I'll show you later but I just wanted to point this out because we're gonna talk about this again um, but you know they you can tra track quality issues you can do a simple sharepoint form you can do a simple excel form you can do a bug tracking system like jira um, there's a lot of ways that you can do this um, but having a way to track quality um, and it might add a little bit to the time that you spend but again the payoff is enormous when you have that data um, for your clients that will um, you know again affect that perception and um, satisfaction so it's definitely worth the time to put in a little extra step for tracking quality issues and then again we're going to report on those issues so what kinds of issues um, should you be tracking and this isn't really something i can tell you um, and i i'm sorry if that disappoints some of you <laughs> but I don't really have a formula for if you track these issues, you're going to have good translation quality. Um, it, it really varies and it varies depending on the goals that you have. So the first step before in any quality process, I recommend setting some goals, some smart goals, specific, measurable, agreed upon, realistic and time based goals that are really specific in terms of how, you know, even if it's like, OK, for um, this month, I want to see a 20% decrease in the number of, um, you know, mistranslations. And so then you can track that and show if you're successful at making that goal. And so by having this data, setting a goal, um, that's, and, and this is something you can do, you know, with your team, with your translators, um, you know, with your clients. Um, but set some goals so that you know exactly what to focus your your quality system on. Um, and so once you do that, um, you can, and I've come up with a list of ideas of what you can track. And I like these paw prints because when I, you know, you think about tracking and, and following, you know, in the woods or whatever, I mean, the, the real goal is to, again get to the root get to the 
the goal of the thing, right? So it's important not to just track metrics because you can, but they should be meaningful to you and your organization. Um, here are a few ideas of some things you might track. There's probably a lot more out there and you might share some of your ideas with us. Um, but so as far as some things to track, one, um, you know, for our organization, it's important that we understand the efficiencies, the efficiency of the translation that happens. Most of our translations, we have a translator and an editor uh, working on them. <clears throat> but, um, you know, time is usually of the essence. Um, and so having a way to match and track efficiency lets us know if we have the right team members assigned, if we have the right tools available, if we have, you know, the right circumstance for, um, for again, our translators to make our SMART goals, um, you know, our SMART efficiency goals. So a couple of like sub goals or, you know, things that you could track to help understand if you have efficiency in your process is one, um, what is the percentage of words from your translation memory? Translation memory, um, it is something that is tracked in your CAT tool. And again, like I said, we'll um, post a training for that in the comments below. Um, but it basically, in you know, a brief definition, is that your translation memory um, is a database. So if you've ever translated a word one time, that the next time you translate a similar document, it'll remember that word. So you don't have to keep and pay for the same word to be translated over and over. For example, how many times, and I see this with some of our clients, where they're paying us to translate words like enter, submit, like who cares? These words already exist out there. So having a memory of that and using it effectively, and that's the key, can it really improve your efficiency on any project and your quality. So coming up with agreed upon, whether it's um, your memory or glossaries or anything like that that you can put work on up front um, and you plug that into your computer aided translation tools, that's, that's one less thing for you know, a human to make an error on if you think about it that way. So, you know, really, I read an article recently about like augmented humans, like we, you know, human translation is so important, but having tools and using computing power in order to affect um, quality is really critical. Um, so tracking your, you know, when we track, okay, how many words um, were used from translation memory, um, the higher that number in many cases, the better because it means you know we had these terms already agreed upon and effective and we were able to track that um, I also like to look at the percentage of edits an editor might make um, and again this can be tracked usually in a computer aided translation tool it definitely is in our tool word B um, however you know if you if you don't opt to use that um, you can still track like if you have your translation done in word and you have your editor um, edit it and um, use track changes, um, there's ways to count those changes and understand how many changes per, um, per language. And, and that's kind of an interesting um, metric to look at because it helps you um, understand, again, the effort spent on the translation and in the end, you know, the, the more edits doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing um, but you know it might signal a problem with your translators you know understanding of the content or it might signal a problem of your editor um, documenting preferential issues so again you know it's kind of um, I think sometimes you have to you, you can't just look at these numbers straight up and only manage by them right you, you still have to integrate that right brain into the data as well and use that critical thought to say, okay, here's this data, but what's the meaning behind it? And how should I react to it? And that's gonna be different in a case by case scenario. So I just wanted to point that out because I, I just, you know, I've given this presentation similarly before and somebody always makes that comment, well, there's so many issues, you can't really track this. No, it's true, you can't know the whole story from numbers. From these these data points but but they definitely give you some insight that 
you know, or some, it's like a, like a target, you know, and they kind of show you where, you know, you might want to dig a little deeper, um, again, to get the truth of the matter. So, um, you could also for efficiency, look at volume per day, time per segment, you know, how much time, how many words is a person doing per day? How much time are they spending? Um, again, it doesn't always mean it's a problem, but it can be a, a signal uh, of a problem if you see some excessive time. Um, accuracy me metrics, this is getting at um, this, uh, these categories I was talking about before. Again, this is an extra step, but it can be worthwhile to understand um, the issues. For example, you know, and you can weight these issues as well, like a mistranslation, um, if an editor has to totally retranslate a paragraph because obviously the translator wasn't familiar with the context or content, or maybe the translator didn't see the context and so was guessing, um, which can happen a lot. I, I've seen um, kind of random words out of context not make sense to a translator. Um, and so mistranslation could potentially be a more weighted issue um, than like a you know spelling error. Um, but again, if there's a lot of spelling errors, um, it could signal a problem uh, you know with your translator. So again, this is all part of like spelling it out, like getting that understanding of of your of your quality. Um, and so, you know, having your editor take a take some time and you know logging these issues um, is going to be an important step to get this this data and this picture. Um, if that's again aligned with your smart goals, <laughs> see how this all ties together. Um, <clears throat> so uh, another thing. It's important to know, I mean, everybody, you know, we're running businesses. If you have a website, you might, uh, maybe you have a web-based business and it's a smaller business, you, you know, translation can be an investment, a big investment. And so being able to understand what that return on investment and where, you know, your money is going is going to be an important thing that you can track and understand and also understand the effectiveness of the translation. Um, for example, um, you know, I, I like to look at things like your bounce rate per language. You can get this off of Google Analytics. And, you know, uh, if you have a lower bounce rate, um, and I've seen this like on my site, I get a lot of people from Russia um, looking at my site. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that they're looking, you know, interested in, in what I have to offer. But I definitely see that the bounce rate for Russian is higher because I don't currently have a native um, translation for Russian. So that's probably an opportunity for us um, because, and that would be an interesting thing to track. Like if we decide, hey, we really want to go after this market. I'm seeing a lot of interest, um, you know, whether it's Russia or Brazil or, you know, Japan. And so when you see these kind of patterns emerge, um, you know, you might just translate a landing page, which is going to be much cheaper than translating your whole site. And then you can start seeing the data from that. And then you can start, again, getting to that higher conversion rate, which is, again, the goal for any web-based business. So so the our return on investment, this, these are things, you know, it's like the title of our webinar. They're knowable. Um, they're things we can take out of that emotional perception, um, you know, and... I, I kind of think about sometimes as a business owner, you get those feelings of like, oh, nobody cares. You know, you have those down days <laughs> and you're just like, why, why am I doing this? Nobody cares. But by looking at the data, you know, you can feel um, more empowered um, to make the proper decisions. The other piece isn't just your own management of your business, but you don't want your clients looking like this either when they're when they're um, looking at your web page. So it's important to have this um, information available to help you, you know, again, with your goal of, of creating a quality site. So I want to take a few minutes now and look at a tool um, that I find to be really helpful. Um, 
which is Power BI. Now, full disclosure, I'm no, you know, data, you know, Power BI expert here. You know, I'm, I'm just like you. I have a business. I got this tool as part of my Office 365 um, subscription and decided, you know, it might be a little more powerful than what I could do in Excel. But again, you know, your SMART goals really should drive this. And your SMART goals may not lead you to a fancy Power BI um, dashboard. It might lead you to more of a simple Excel chart. So, you know, you don't have to do this to track data, but I am just showing it to you because I have found it to be really useful Again, with the idea that I'm pulling data from a variety of resources to get a full um, a full picture, and Power BI is a really um, great way to do that. So this is some data I pulled together um, recently for a project that we did, um, and you know it's to pull in data. You just it's a simple act of just coming here to the Get Data, and um, if you can look at this list of all the data you could easily pull into Power BI, it's really cool. I'm SharePoint, remember my SharePoint, full, my SharePoint form? That's where I'm getting a lot of um, this quality data I'm reporting. I'm also pulling um, from a SQL database from my um, project management Linguist Link system. Um, I'm also pulling data from uh, my financial data. You can pull it from QuickBooks. Um, you can look at things, your help desk support things, um, Google Analytics. Um, so as you can see, it's really powerful um, if you want to really um, easily track. And so it, a little time spent making your dashboard will create a scenario where every month it's just a matter of refreshing and you know maybe digging a little deeper in one area or another area. So. Um, you know, the sky's the limit, but that's why your SMART goals are going to help keep you focused on exactly what to track and how to track it. So once you get here, um, you can see I pulled in all those data sources and they're all over here as, as tables in my, um, that are available for me to do whatever I want. And so I could create um, different visuals. I could create a, a map. Um, I don't know what I would do with the map in this case, but you know, it would be great to see your regions and bounce rates and you know, it might really fit in your organization. I can create, um, you know, goal charts like this is um, a chart that I could set a goal and see how close I'm coming to that goal. I love this one actually quite a bit. Um, I do these little donut charts as you can see down here. This is a a cool way to, and as you can see, it's all, it's smart. Like I can say, I'm really interested in looking more at Arabic. And the reason I want to do that is because I realized I, um, sorry, I, I'm missing a, okay, don't look at that yet. Oh, don't look at that yet. Okay, I'm going to get there just a second. One moment, please. <laughs> um, okay, well, obviously, I'm gonna have to do this the um, old fashioned way, which is recreate this graph, which is not a problem. Um, but I can look, I was, I had a nice little graph here comparing the languages um, with each other. Um, you could see I can just pull that really quickly together because you see how quickly I made that with just pulling my little data over here um, once I get this I can see oh you know Arabic is kind of an issue um, because uh, it needed more corrections in the text than some of the other languages and so you know if I choose to I could click on this and just look at the you know Arabic um, data and again it helps me get to um, the big picture like okay so Arabic was an issue what are the the you know categories of issues that came up the most for this language um, 
you know, uh, what level of issues came up the most? Um, you know, is there an issue here? How much did I spend on Arabic? And did I get a value for that language? So it depends on your, you know, level of curiosity. The cool thing too with Power BI um, is you can actually, um, if you take it online, I'm just gonna pull this up over here. Uh, you take it online, you can actually ask questions. Um, I might not be able to show you this right now, but it's a really cool feature where you can actually go online and say, you know, what was my profit for Arabic? And it'll actually show you. It's like a little Google search with your data. So um, I just encourage you, I'm not gonna show you that piece of it right now because um, I don't wanna take the time that's not coming up. Oh, there it is. I'll at least show you where it is on here because it is really powerful. Um, so with Power BI, I was showing you the desktop version, but there's an online version as well. Um, which is over here and see I can pull it up it comes up on my SharePoint site and the data is all right here for me to look at respond to I can share with my team everybody has access to it you can see you know this is like a way to understand and then here's what I was talking about you can ask questions about your data so you know if I can say um, I don't know what and you can just um, ask them in real time and it'll show you a lot of interesting information. So that's one definitely definite thing that Power BI can do that a Google spreadsheet can't do for you. And so um, that's another reason I'm, I'm really fond of this tool. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I'm not going to give you a full training on Power BI only to say, um, I encourage you if you have it and there are a lot of um, resources available to you for Power BI and so we'll put some links in the comments below if you're interested in, in digging a little deeper on how to use it um, but it, I learned it in maybe a day um, and I'm in it all the time like every day the first thing I do is I come in get my cup of coffee and I check my dashboard to see you know what's going on with our financial health what's going on with our quality what's going on with our clients and I can get the whole picture in just by refreshing it so I can't say enough about how powerful that is um, so let me come back here <clears throat> um, so I mean that's kind of the meat of what I wanted to talk about today I didn't really want to take the full hour because like I said I want to be respectful of your time but um, I was curious if any questions came up and um, Ashton told me that she was gonna call if um, there was anything in the chat so um, we haven't figured out yet how to get um, someone remote into the presentation that'll be for next time um, but Ashton's not calling so it makes me kind of think maybe we don't have questions um, right now but again if something comes up and we can address it just leave it in the comments below and and we'll definitely write you a response um, I also wanted you to know um, again for those of you who stuck it out and stayed oh I'm getting a phone call. It's Ashton. Hello, Ashton. Hi, Stacy. I'm calling in. Um, so it looks like there aren't any questions in the live chat right now, but I just thought that it would be, you know, a good idea to wait a little bit to see if anything did come up. Um, but in the time that we're waiting, I did want to ask a couple of things. Um, first of all, my biggest question, it seems that Power BI is, a particularly powerful tool um, but I was wondering about how long would you say um, it takes before you know compiling this data um, starts to show kind of these meaningful patterns that you can build off of yeah that's a good question Ashton because it, there is some work around this I it, I'm not saying um, you know one day you're gonna put together a dashboard and gonna know everything um, right. it, there's a process involved and and um, 
it does take some time. I mean, maybe it took me, uh, you know, a month or two with my team and a few meetings to kind of come up with, okay, what are things that are interesting to us? What kind of things do I want to be able to see? Some of this, um, I was, I had, <clears throat> I had already been looking at in a number of different tools. And so Power BI allowed me to pull it together. So I kind of already knew what I wanted to track from other tools. But I was looking at five or six different sources, you know, and I, w I didn't have like one complete dashboard. <clears throat> so, right. so there is a little bit of a time investment, but the payoff is huge to be able to just mm -hmm. refresh this and know what's going on. It saves me all the time I was going to different sources and maybe forgetting or maybe like, oh, and again, it's, it's about knowing what's knowable. Um, and, and having that available. So I would just, I would definitely plan on investing. The more time, the better if you have it. I know time is always the issue, but again, you'll see a return on that time investment. Um, you know, and again, what you really want to see is the, the return by um, avoiding your clients looking like this. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, All right, cool. Good to know. Cool. Okay, I think one more question. Cool. And then I'll hang up unless we have any other questions that pop up. Um, so I was just wondering, I know that you mentioned that, um, you know, the categories and things that different companies track are kind of dependent on what, you know, a, a individual business's smart goals um, mm -hmm. are for their product, for example. Um, but I was just wondering off the top of your head, would you recommend maybe just one or two categories that Power BI can kind of compile um, that a company could track that's kind of applicable across the board. I mean, you know, I said, or, you know, you said before that it's kind of individualized, but I was just wondering if you had maybe like one or two that you would mainly recommend. Okay. Well, that's, that's definitely, um, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to say this when I was talking about those categories. Um, actually, let me go here to, uh, Oh my goodness, SharePoint is just too powerful. Um, when we're looking at those categories, I did not make those up. Those are, oh. yeah, those categories come from, um, well, there used to be an organization called Lisa, um, and they were, they established some of these categories. Now, Lisa doesn't exist anymore, but they Lisa was like the localization institute of, I don't even know. Um, but they established these, these categories um, as sort of a, trying to make them an industry standard. Uh, now, Lisa doesn't exist, but there's other organizations that are also working on coming up with some industry standards that can be known. Um, that you would want to stay on top of if you really want to go deep into into uh, language quality. Um, some of the organizations you might want to keep an eye on, one is um, GALA, Globalization and Localization Association. Um, they're based up in Seattle, and um, they have some groups working on some standardizations. Um, there's also Common Sense Advisory, um, ATA has a few things out there. Um, so definitely I would keep an eye on, you know, what's going on in the industry, um, you know, and, and, and maybe we, we can link a couple of those in the comments. Yeah, totally. And, and definitely, um, you know, connect with us, whether it's social media or, um, sign up for our mailing list so that we can, um, keep you informed of, of those kind of things as they come up because they're really, um, important to our users. Um, but yeah, so I didn't make those up. I think so it's kind of cool in the sense to track industry standards um, because it gives you um, again some like how are we in comparison to other companies doing this you know uh -huh. and hopefully as these organizations evolve in this um, and I'm part of um, you know full disclosure I'm part of the gala group and I've been involved in some of those quality meetings there and I'm still actively into that and so as those evolve um, it, it's going to be really powerful to kind of know um, and help you set those smart goals, you know. Um, you know, and like in manufacturing, they have standards like a 98% you know, quality rating or something like that. And so they have these kind of industry ratings and then it gives you a goal to work towards. So um, 
you know, again, this is if you're really heavily like into a quality system, I would definitely keep in touch with that kind of stuff. If you're just really wanting some assurances that your website's being translated and you don't really care about, you know, that whole, you know, system out there, um, you can make up your own categories. There's no rules about this. It's just more right. of, um, talking about the outcome that you want to see from that. Cool. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for um, your call in. <laughs> yeah, of course. It looks like there aren't any other questions, but, you know, like Stacy said in the beginning, if you're watching this later, um, just comment on the video or you can um, you can email hello at mindlinksresources.com and I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have as well. Um, okay, so thank you for your time, Stacy. This is a wonderful webinar and... <laughs> Uh, well, we'll talk to you later. <laughs> thank you, Ashton. And All right. on, we'll talk to you later. And on our next okay. webinar, um, we'll find a way to have Ashton also here. She's calling from sunny Chico, California, <laughs> where it's really awful and rainy here, so I don't blame her. Um, but, <clears throat> but yeah, I appreciate the call in and the questions and kind of thinking about this subject in a new and cool way. So thank you for your time today. And as I promised at the beginning, I have an offer for those of you who stuck it out. And, and we'll put this all in the, well, we don't want to put all of this in the comments, right? Because you stuck it out, you get rewarded. But for those of you interested, um, I have, I would love to send you one of our swag bags. Um, to help you be um, successful as a quality translation specialist. Uh, we have really a uh, cool human say it best bag um, promoting translation quality. And we have little stickers you can put on the back of your laptop and notebooks. So we want to send you a swag bag. So what I want you to do at the end of this, um, if you register it, I'll go ahead and send you a... Um, a feedback form, um, which I really appreciate um, your registering, and I appreciate your feedback on this webinar. And also, um, if you go to webinars at or webinars.mindlink.com, um, we'll have a little landing page where you can um, you can order your swag bag. And for those of you, maybe you're like, oh, I hate that kind of stuff. That's cool. I mean, I don't get it, but I realize, you know, everything is different. So <laughs> everyone's different. So I would also like to um, give you a coupon. Um, and I'm going to give you a coupon for 20% um, off of one language for um, your translation. And this is going to be a great way if you're considering translating even just a landing page. It's a way, great way to get that off the ground and start seeing some data come in about that page. And, and so we'll help you um, get that going and set that up for you. Um, as, and then, um, yeah, you'll be on your way to being a quality translation provider. So, well, anyway, I appreciate your time today. And again, we'll, we'll, um, we'll do this again um, probably next month. Um, so if you have ideas for topics that you want us to cover, um, let us know in the comments. Or again, like Ashton said, you can email us at hello at mindlinkresources.com. Um, so shoot us an email and let us, or write in, a, in the comments what kind of topics you'd love to see us related to translation, quality, um, anything. I mean, if it's interesting to us, it's interesting to you, I'm happy to talk about anything. Again, you know, I got that right brain thing going on. So I, I'm a talker. So let us know if there's anything you want us to cover and we're happy to do it. Um, but in the meantime, I really thank you again for your time today and um, I look forward to um, seeing you on further webinars. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, keep, keep quality in mind. It's a good fight to fight. <laughs>
Thank you.